Welcome back everybody. Today we're going over this little sucker that you see right here. It's the Elcan Spectre DR 1 to 4 powered optic. So first and foremost, things not cheap. This is the most expensive optic that I own and I purchased this one probably six to eight months ago and we've been using it uh, throughout videos here that you guys have seen on the channel but uh, one thing that's kind of cool is I was in one of the first military units to adopt this actual scope right here so I had a good bit of experience with it while I was in the military and now to have the civilian version of it which is the exact same thing with just a little bit different color um, we'll roll in a picture of the uh, military one it's a little bit darker color than this one and this one's just a different shade of FTE but it also comes in black for what it's worth so I thought it good bit of experience with this scope um, in a lot of different applications both on belt fed weapons as well as on the AR-15 and M4 carbines so what we're gonna do is uh, let the dogs take a look at it come back in look at the details and then let you know what we think of it overall at the end Getting into the details of the scope up front here in front of the lens, you'll see we do have a threaded portion to thread in your kill flash should you choose to do so. This is it right here, but I'm leaving it off just for the sake of simplicity here for the review. It does not come with kill flash. If you want that, you have to order it separately. Um, so you can do so if um, you're wanting to reduce your glare signature in the day or just your signature at night because any kind of uh, optics that you're using which have battery power can emit um, some light particularly under night vision out front so that will reduce that if you have the kill flash on there moving on back we have the windage elevation here these are half MOA clicks both for windage and elevation the scope is designed to be zeroed at 100 meters in order to use the ballistic reticle which we'll get into here in just a second and our elevation adjustment is right here it's this wheel thing and I have a uh, very specific video on zeroing this optic so if you're interested go check that one out i don't want to waste too much time here in the video but both are half moa clicks and one thing that's very different about this scope than any of the other ones that i know of anyway is that when you're actually zeroing it you're not actually moving anything inside the scope itself you're moving the scope versus the base so the scope is actually moving in relationship to the base of the scope and that's how you zero it and one cool thing about that is that it also allows for the backup iron sights to stay zeroed when you're zeroing the reticle you're zeroing the backup iron sights as well we have the peep on the rear here and the little blade here on the front um, i've tested it the scope is designed to be zeroed at 100 meters when you're shooting at 25 meters with the backup iron sights which is exactly what i was doing um, it seems to be right on mine were about an inch low which is where you'd expect it to be and one other advantage of having those backup iron sights built into it <coughs> is that if you get any sort of mud rain fog or anything on your scope which i've never seen these fog but i have seen of course mud and rain get on there and you can't see as well through there um, as you'd like you can use those backup iron sights in a pinch um, and you can also on the rear here you see these little screws you can mount a uh, red dot sight on there as well if you choose to do so the way this scope goes from 1x to 4x is pretty cool so we have this little lever right here which is fixed in place you can push it like that but that's not going to do anything but if you want to actually move out to four power you push down and then forward all the way forward and then click into place and you notice the little click it made um, in terms of audible signature you can do it very slow and deliberate if you don't want to give away an audible signature and still do it so that's kind of cool it's silent if you want it to be or just quick because it is spring loaded if you don't want it to be so that's one of the coolest things about this scope for sure and one one thing i always point out when i'm talking about like uh, variable power scopes like a one by six or a one by four is most people are going to run them either at one power or four power not so much in between so if you're one of those people that's certainly cool because this one here has both those settings and nothing in between but what it does is it essentially gives you a red dot sight as well as a four power sight all in one and uh, if you want to think about that here we have a couple different ACOGs we have our uh, TA31 and then the uh, TA44 so it's kind of like having both of these in this one site and uh, I should mention as well 
it does say 1x, and this is something I harp on in many different videos. It's not a true 1x. It's probably more like a 1.1 or 1.2x, if you will, scope. So there is a little bit of magnification even in 1x, but for CQB type work, you're really not going to notice that at all, just like you would on, say, like a, like a Vortex 1x prism scope. Uh, it seems to be 1x, even though if you actually look at it real, real close, there is a little bit of magnification in there. It mounts to any 1913 style rails by these arms levers here, so you can open these up. And what you'll notice here is that you have these little slots, and when you close it down, it clamps down. You also have this crossbar here, which is really going to help engage your 1913 style rails as well to make it very secure and repeatable when you mount it down. I've uh, taken it off and remounted it, and I've not noticed any point of impact shift. I'm sure there's always minimal, like there might be half MOA or something like that, but uh, nothing I've ever noticed. And one thing to also point out is these little holes right back here in the base of the optic. What that does is when you mount it on your rifle, if you want to zip tie it or tie it down or use some wire to tie it in there, um, you can do so. And that way you can ensure that even in the harshest conditions, they'll never pop off. Although realistically, I've never had these arms levers come loose on the LCAN ever. And uh, like I said, I've used this a pretty fair amount in both the civilian and military applications, and it's always been very solid in that regard. Earlier I mentioned that it's like having two optics in one and one downside of that is that the weight is almost like having two optics like in one in some cases. So the weight on it, including the mount and everything that you see here, is right at 22 ounces. So not lightweight at all, but it is super durable and super rugged and that tends to be one of the cons of prism style scopes, which this is. Um, so they tend to be very durable. That's one of the advantages of them. Most prism style scopes are extremely durable. This one is as well, but it's a little bit on the heavy side at 22 ounces. And uh, what's really kind of cool about this is when you're looking through the actual rear objective lens here, and I don't think my camera will focus on it, but we could try. Um, when you're looking through there, when you actually flip the lever, I think you can actually see it a little bit there. When you flip the lever, one thing that's actually happening is you're actually flipping a prism lens in there. So you can see that circle kind of fade in and fade out. And what's happening is the prism lens is flipping around and that's how you change your magnification. So that's the only moving piece in there, which again helps to create a very rugged and durable optic. So now right here is how you're going to adjust your illumination. So you have five different settings both ways. So right now it's in the off position. You can see the little line there is pointing to the off. And when you move up one, that's your night vision setting for your dot being illuminated. So one thing I should point out is that when you're in the one power setting, like we are right here, we can see the lever in the one power, your dot is actually going to be a six MOA dot. But when you flip it out to the four power setting, it's going to be a 1.5 MOA dot. That's pretty cool stuff. And again, it has to do with how the prism lens on the inside moves. So again, we're on our night vision setting now. And then as you just move it up five different settings, all the way up to five, which is just going to illuminate the dot. Now, if you go back to your off setting and you come down where you see these little plus symbols, what that's going to do is illuminate the whole reticle. Again, this is your night vision setting for the whole reticle, and then it goes into visible, and it's plenty daylight bright. I know that's something folks always ask. Is it daylight bright? It's super daylight bright. It will glow even in the most extreme uh, desert sun, so no issues with it there. And in terms of the actual reticle, there's going to be some things that you can see here. You'll see the little uh, BDC lines all the way from 300 meters down to a thousand meters and it is calibrated for the M4 rifle with 855 ammo. Now of course um, you're going to have slight variations depending on altitude, ammo, barrel length, all that stuff but for most folks it's going to be really close and sheer error is going to be more of an error than the actual BDC will be. Um, the little hash lines going across out there when you see going down to 600 meters those are calibrated for 19 inches and 19 inches is generally considered to be the width of a man shoulder to shoulder as he looks at you. So if you're looking at an enemy downrange, uh, you can range estimate and see if his shoulders line up with those lines. That's the distance he's at and that's the holdover you want to use. And then below that, you see the little circles and I think that's certainly a good thing there because at those distances that you, it's, you're generally using it as an aerial weapon, particularly when you get down to eight, nine hundred and a thousand. So just keeping it in the center there will get you pretty close and let you lay down suppressive fire if you're using an M4 or, or an AR-15 for that type of use.
I think we covered most of the details of the scope, but there's a few things that we left out. Uh, number one is going to be eye relief. One thing that makes this very nice versus some of the ACOG models out there, particularly the four power models, is that this has good eye relief. So like those four power ACOG models, like the 31 and the 01, I think those have a 1.5 inch eye relief. This one here has a 2.75 inch to 3 inch, depending on which setting you have it on. Realistically, it's probably 2.75 inch from a practical perspective for both. So you have good eye relief and that's beneficial for many reasons. Uh, number one, if you're using it on a weapon that has a long stock, if you're using body armor, if you're shooting from unorthodox, non-standard positions. So if you're shooting down a hill, um, on a barrier up into a window or something like that, it comes into play in a way that a lot of folks don't appreciate until you're in that situation. So that's certainly a good thing. Um, one of the downsides of this optic is, again, in my experience, I use this in a military application, so it saw some pretty rough views, and the rear sight would occasionally break off. Of course, this sight is made by Raytheon, um, and they do warranty it. You know, if that happens, they'll send you a new one or, or put a new one on there for you, so no big deal. But I saw it break off more than once, so that's uh, certainly something to be considered. Um, now for most civilians I'm sure you're not going to see anything like that but something I wanted to note and uh, thirdly I guess to note is the glass. The glass clarity on this is super clear like I always rave about ACOG glass quality which is something that is hard to show through a camera because the camera lens always degrades it but if you've never looked through an ACOG you can't appreciate it and if you've never looked through an LCAN it's hard to appreciate it as well but it's as good as any like three, four thousand dollar, you know, German or Japanese glass made scope. So it's exceptional glass, which is awesome. Just great clarity when you're looking down range, particularly at four power, and it's something you can appreciate. So a downside, of course, like we talked about in the intro, is that it's not cheap. So I think the MSRP on these is like twenty eight hundred dollars. Real world street price, it's generally gonna be somewhere from $22 to $2,600. Um, I bought this one over on Amazon. You guys can check it out in the link below if you guys are looking for it. But not cheap at all, you know, so that's kind of the downside of it. But it is, again, like having two optics in one with ACOG durability. So if that's something you want and need for your needs and you want that durability, you're willing to pay the cost, it's definitely something to look at. If it's not, then it's not. So that's cool. But uh, if you have the money and it fits your use, I 100% recommend the LCAG. LCAN. It's an awesome, awesome scope and uh, really, there's not a whole lot of downsides to it outside of the cost from a practical use perspective. If you guys have any other questions that we did cover in this video, by all means, you can post down in the comments section. You can also post over at my Facebook page as always, but thanks for watching guys. I truly appreciate it. Thanks for subscribing. If you haven't subscribed yet, please go ahead and do so and I'll see you in the next video.